Time community, and welcome to the Wheel of Time pod through. I'm Tim. And I'm Teresa. And together, we're going to be walking through Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series. How are you doing, Teresa? It's been a day. <laughs> Aww. Um, you know, with the hearings and everything, I am, I'm very glad that uh, I've got the Wheel of Time to serve as a distraction. Yeah. Um, but you know what? We had the first day of fall a couple days ago, so I'm excited about that, and I'm enjoying this little switch up that we're doing. This is yeah. a fun little experiment. It is going to be fun. How are you doing? I'm, uh, you know, change, me, not good with, so I'm a little nervous <laughs> about tonight, but, uh, you know, we're going to make it. It's going to be great. All right. Before we get started, uh, we just want to remind everyone that this is a reread, so there will be spoilers. You've been warned. So, Teresa, what are we going to be doing in this episode? In this week's episode, wolves, wolves, wolves. (laughs) Uh, Chapter 22 is called A Path Chosen, and the icon is a tree. Here's a quick summary of chapter 22 to act as a reminder for those of you who are not reading along with us. Perrin wakes up alone and a little rattled from the events of the previous night. He heads downriver hoping to find some sign that Egwin has made it across. He discovers Bella's distinctive hoof prints and soon finds Egwin, who admits that the shaggy mare got her across the river. Neither of them has seen any sign of the others, and they discuss what to do. Egwin feels that they should follow the plan Moraine laid out for them and head to Whitebridge. Perrin feels the Whitebridge is too obvious a destination, and they will be too easy for Trollocs and Meridral to find, and without an Aes to protect them. He proposes that they cut across the land and head straight to Camelot. Surprisingly, Egwin agrees, figuring that there will be villages along the way where they can stop and ask for directions. The two head off with only a vague idea of where they're going, but hoping for the best. We open with Perrin dreaming of Emmons Field and working at the forge. He is such a homebody, (laughs) and that never changes. Even after everything that happens throughout the whole 14-book series and no matter how important Perrin gets, his dream is still to be a blacksmith in Evans Field and to start a family. Where it's, it's simple and things work the way he expects exactly, them to. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. He, he really does crave a simple life. So I just got to say that Evans Fielders are prepared. Right? Perrin has his sling and something to make a snare, like, on him, even though he lost his saddlebags when he went into the river. That's impressive. It really is. I love how methodical and logical Perrin is. Like He thinks everything through and, and takes his time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he thinks this little thought to himself, one thing at a time, the most important first. That was his way. Right. He prioritizes and tackles each thing accordingly. And it's just one of my favorite parts of his personality. Yeah, and it's stark contrast to, say, like Matt, for instance. He's <laughs> yeah. so impulsive. yeah. <laughs> so Perrin is a blacksmith through and through And the first tracks that he notices Is the hoof print of a horseshoe with a double crossbar That he himself probably made at the forge Right He recognizes it as Bella's print right away Because it's distinctive Because of that extra Cross Crossbar for the reinforcement And I just I, I love that the blacksmith Notices the hoof print <laughs> Right Nothing disturbed on the trail or anything, just that print. Yeah. Um, So Perrin's been worried about Egwin this whole time and what state she's in. Mm -hmm. But Egwin is not a damsel in distress, even though Perrin thinks of her that way. Mm. So when he comes across her, Egwin is armed with a thick branch like a club and grim determination to beat down whatever is about to appear. She's not going down without a fight. She can take care of herself. And she has her back covered, too. Like, she's got... She, yeah, she's, she's against Bella. She's ready for the fight. Absolutely. Also, okay, speaking of Bella, she manages to keep a hold of Bella, even though they went into the river, which means she has food in her saddlebags. Mm-hmm. Um, she's got some supplies, not a lot of supplies, but she's got some. And she was able to start a pi- uh, fire. So Perrin has to admit that... She's in better shape than he was himself. You <laughs> yeah, because who, who woke up just passed out on the side of the With river With nothing, bank. you know. <laughs> yeah. He really underestimates her. Yeah. We give Awen a lot of flack, but I want to point out that Nynaeve's training has really taken hold. Okay. Egwin's first reaction to seeing Perrin is to run up and give him a hug. And right. then she immediately starts tending to him like a wisdom would, 
oh. warming him up by the fire, making sure that he has something to eat. Most other people would have just asked him if he needed anything and then maybe not done anything. Uh-huh. She just grabs him and starts taking care of him right away. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think of it like that. And speaking of training, <laughs> Egwin calls out Perrin for his comment about wishing that he could be rid of Aes Sedai. Yes. Yeah. She's offended that he is still so prejudiced after everything that's happened with Moraine and what she's done for them. I mean, well, she... Well, and also, like, because she wants to be an Aes Sedai, so his prejudice against Moraine and Aes Sedai now includes her. Right, right. So at this point, Perrin still has not been convinced that they can trust Moraine. And right. To be honest, it took me books and yeah. <laughs> books before I 100% cu- trusted her. Me too, totally. Uh, some of her tactics just... They feel kind of shady sometimes. Yeah, they do. She's really manipulative. But Egwin is 100% right for calling him out on his comment because it's more about the lingering Two Rivers stubbornness than a valid concern. Uh He never really gets over that prejudice, even when he is saddled with several Aes Sedai as traveling companions later on. (laughs) Right. Perrin's plan was good in theory. (laughs) I know. Well, okay, so... He was right that he should take an unexpected route. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it made sense because he's right. I mean, White Bridge is the obvious place to find them. The Mirdral right. and the Trollocs know that. The problem is that he really had no concept of the land. You know, like, he had a very... Well, he thought he had a general idea of where Camelin was. Yeah. But he admits to himself that... It was a vague idea based on the few times he studied the map at Bran's Inn. And Bran himself admitted that it probably wasn't very accurate. So the reality was that he was completely lost in wandering the wilderness, which is a terrible idea. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely terrible. That brings us very abruptly to the end of chapter 22. These chapters probably could have just been one chapter. Yeah, The break is rather arbitrary. It is. Before we start chapter 23, here's a word from our sponsors. Today's episode of the Wheel of Time Pot Through is brought to you by Maps. Only have a vague idea of where you are or where you're going? You need a map. A long, long time ago, people discovered that the world was big and it was easy to get lost in it. So as they roamed out and discovered new lands, they wrote that shit down. Now, all you need to do to know where you are and where you're going is look at a map. Maps. Without them, you're just lost. Chapter 23 is titled Wolf Brother, and the icon is a wolf. Duh. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Perrin and Egwin travel theoretically towards Camelin, arguing the whole time because Perrin thinks that he should be in charge, but Egwin won't listen to him. She insists that they take turns riding Bella, which he hates, and when he discovers that she's been trying to use the power to start their fires, he tries to make her swear to stop, which she flat out refuses to do. They quickly run out of food and don't have much luck hunting, so when they come across a wild-looking man with yellow eyes roasting rabbits and offering a place at his fire, they are quick to join him. He introduces himself as Elias Machira, says that he's been watching them for a few days, and not to panic when his friends join the party. Four wolves settle down around them, and there are many more beyond the firelight. Elias explains that he can talk to wolves, and they tell him that Perrin can too. He explains that it is not of the power. It is a very old thing, men and wolves hunting together, that has returned. Elias asks them what their deal is and why they're in the middle of nowhere. Egwin very convincingly delivers a well-rehearsed story, but Elias says that the wolves know that they are lying, and they are not happy about it. They can read Trollocs in Perrin's mind, and there is a very tense moment when Perrin isn't sure that he and Egwin are going to get out of this alive. He tells a true story from start to finish, and Dapple, the leader of the pack, leader of the pack. decides that it would be safer if Perrin travels with Elias and the wolves. Perrin denies that he can talk to wolves and says that they are going to Camelin to meet up with Moraine. Elias doesn't think too highly of Aes Sedai, but he says that they will travel with Perrin and Egwin anyway to protect them. A young male wolf, Byrne, thinks that this is all a waste of time and confronts Dapple. 
but Dapple leads the pack. Leader of the pack. He and several other young males angrily leave to go hunt Trollocs. Despite Perrin's denials, he is able to feel the angry wolves leaving. Perrin and Egwin are both jockeying to be in charge. Mm-hmm. He just assumes that he should be the leader, and there's really no reason why Egwin should listen to him about this. Right? He doesn't know what he's doing any more than she does. Seriously, yeah. He just assumes. Okay, so given what's going on in the world today, this chapter does not start off on a good note. Mm -hmm. Um, Perrin threatens to put Egwin in the saddle himself if she does not get in it on her own. I think this was originally intended to come off as comedy, but it just, it gives me pause. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of a similar situation with Fail that'll happen in a later book, and I'm sure we'll cover that at length when we get there. Oh, yeah, but not today. Not today. Don't have the energy. Nope, nope, nope. (laughs) But what happens here just is not right. Uh Uh-huh. He views it as Egwin bullying him every time she stands her ground, but there's no reason for him to assume that he should take the leadership role Instead of taking a more shared responsibility in things. Yeah. Um, Maybe it's just the headspace that I'm living in lately, but this just bothers me this time around more than it usually does. Absolutely. And just as a blanket statement, as a general rule, can we please, men, (laughs) stop writing, stop acting this out when you're writing screens for movies, stop using... Men physically picking up or moving women as your quote unquote physical comedy. <laughs> like, yeah. this happens a lot with Perrin because we've already established that he's big and strong. Yes. He is physically capable of picking someone up and moving them. And oftentimes, when he's not able to um, win an argument verbally, he will simply pick the person up. <laughs> Let me amend that pick the woman up. And move her to get past her if she's blocking his path or put her on a horse or do whatever. Gently, but yeah, still. Yeah, gently. Absolutely still. gently. He is not abusive. He is not abusive. He is not, you know, trying to hurt anybody. It's never anything like that. And you're right. I'm pretty sure it's written as physical comedy. And it's not just the Wheel of Time. I see this all over the place. Like, you, yeah. there was this trend in uh, YA novels where the main guy was always picking up the main girl and carrying her around. It happened in Twilight. It happened in Divergent. It happened in, um, I can't think of any others at the moment, but like there were several that I read in like a a short time City of Bones and stuff like that. Okay, yeah, Yeah, I think I, I think I read that. But it's like, okay, this is not fun. This is not sexy. This is super stupid. Women have legs. They can walk. Like, just let's stop physically... Flexing your muscles and moving a woman just because they're doing something you don't like. Right. It's not okay. It's also not okay for a woman to, like, hit a man and just get away with it. Right. Which is also a thing that happens, which we will talk about later when fail comes up. (laughs) But, like, just can we stop all this physical stuff? Like, use your words, people. Use your freaking words. On both sides of the fence. (sighs) Anyway... I'm a little ranty. I'm going to stop. But seriously, this is not funny. Like, it's it's supposed to be funny, but it's not. We need to stop this. But something happens here is funny. That's true. Perrin is too big to ride Bella. Like, <laughs> in this instance, he is right. Like, Egwin's insistence that he ride Bella is ill-conceived because he's simply too big. And I love that there's this quote. Every time he put his foot in the stirrup, the shaggy mare looked at him with what he was sure was reproach. (laughs) So we have a cat who, incidentally, is also named Bella. Yes. Um, Not after the horse, but anyway, whatever. Um, She looks at us with what I can only categorize as reproach when she thinks it's time for us to feed her. (laughs) And we aren't doing it <laughs> even when it's hours ahead of schedule yes yeah and i i just i picture the look on her face every time i read this because <laughs> i know exactly what look bella is giving parent yeah <laughs> because our bella gives it to us all the time <laughs> yeah. so along the same lines of what we were talking about 
It's completely unreasonable for Perrin to ask Egwin to swear not to use the power. Right. She is completely justified in saying that he would not give up his axe and he would not handicap himself if he had another option. And true, I mean, she may not know how to channel yet, but Moraine showed her how to start a flame. Right. So she does know enough to start a fire without causing too much damage. And it's just more of this Two Rivers stubborn prejudice. Yeah, I agree. Like, Perrin is out of line on this one. He absolutely is. So, switching gears a little bit. Okay. They're lost in the wilderness and run out of food. Uh-huh. <laughs> Side note about being alone in the wilderness, it's uh, kind of odd how not being around other humans can be a little unsettling. Uh-huh. I was backpacking in the uh, National Par- Yosemite National Park when I was in college and spent 14 days in the wilderness with just seven other people. Uh-huh. After five days of not seeing a single other human being except for us... And then seeing signs of bears visiting the perimeter of our camp overnight when we were sleeping Uh every morning when we woke up, (laughs) Uh, the sense of isolation starts to ratchet up your paranoia level. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So I can only imagine what it must have been like to have the added terror of the experience of Shadow Lorgoth topping, like being put right on top of that sense of like ratcheting paranoia. Uh Uh-huh. Um, so as they come across these different ruins and stuff, as they're going through the wilderness, they're steering clear. Mm-hmm. And I 100% am on board with steering clear. I get it. Yeah, I absolutely. Totally do. And uh, even like Egwin starts to have nightmares. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. They smell smoke and Perrin thinks that it could be Trollocs. Mm. So he considers his axe. And uh, the book says... It was a weapon, but neither his hidden practice behind the forge nor Land's teaching had really prepared him to use it as one. Even the battle before Shatter Logoth was too vague in his mind to give him any confidence. He could never quite manage that void that Rand and the warder talked about either. Even later, when Perrin gets adept at using his axe, oh, yeah. he's never a fighter at heart, except... When he's channeling the wolves. Right. Um, He really struggles dealing with how much fighting and killing he has to do throughout the series. Mm -hmm. Except when he has that, like, um, time when he's really tapping into his, like, wolf nature. Yeah. And then he's on the hunt with the wolves. Right. He's part of the pack. Yeah. And then, like, the bloodlust takes over and that, like, animal instinct, basically, takes over, and then he is lethal. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, God, yes. Oh, my gosh. Like, Perrin's great with that axe um, as far as effectiveness. Um, but once he gets, like, once he snaps out of it and he gets back to his core nature, um, he always just has such a Remorse. struggle dealing with it. Yeah. You know, he he hates the axe and he hates the fighting and you know, he, like we said, he's a blacksmith. He wants a simple life. He doesn't want to be a warrior. He doesn't want to be a soldier. He doesn't want to be a king. He doesn't want to have to deal with this stuff. He and it really bothers to, him. He just wants to fix things. Exactly. Yeah. He's, in a way, he's an artist. Yeah. You know, he's sensitive. He's a cute little emo parent. <laughs> you know, like, he doesn't like all this fighting all the time. Um, and especially in these early books, when he's still getting used to it when it's still the first time or his second time, you know, um, it's, it's really rough. You know, he really struggles. Like, can I use this? And then if I can, what does that say about me? Yeah. You know, poor guy, poor guy. When they smell the fire Mm -hmm. and Egwin says that it could be rabbit. Perrin thinks it could be Trollocs. Translation. Perrin thinks that it could be people they smell cooking because we all know what Trollocs put in their cook pot. Gross. <laughs> so I think that's why he asks her to stay put uh-huh. so he can go investigate it. Okay. Uh, not be- just because it's dangerous. There's definitely that there. Uh-huh. But he's hoping to spare her the sight of what they might find if it's true. That's fair. But instead, he comes across Elias. Yeah. And... Elias looks crazy <laughs> and dangerous. Yeah. 
So I'm just going to read what the book says. Like, this is Elias's description because what? He was the strangest fellow Perrin had ever seen. For one thing, his clothes all seemed to be made from animal skins with the fur still on, even his boots and the odd flat-topped round cap on his head. His cloak was a crazy quilt of rabbit and squirrel. His trousers appeared to be made from the long-haired hide of a brown and white goat. Gathered at the back of his neck with a cord, his graying brown hair hung to his waist. A thick beard fanned across half his chest. A long knife hung at his belt, almost a sword, and a bow and quiver stood propped against a limb close to hand. Yeah. I'm just going to say nope. You know, like what you were saying, they're isolated in the wilderness, they're a little paranoid. You come across this guy looking like some goat man demon who's about to, to kill you. Peachy. Nope, nope, all sorts of nope, no thank you and goodbye. I don't yeah. care how hungry I am. David Crockett's demon cousin. Right? Yeah. Like this, oh yeah. no, no thank you. <laughs> and to make things worse, um, it's creepy that we, Elias has been watching them for a couple of days. Yeah, totally. But, you know, they're both so hungry that the readily available food that he puts in front of them makes them trust him sooner than they probably would normally. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, They're starving, and that makes up for a whole manner of things. Yes, it does. It does. (laughs) But, okay, I'm just going to say it. Rabbit's gross. I don't like it. Yeah, I've had rabbit. I've had it a couple times, a couple different ways. Um I don't like it. I really don't. It's nasty. Rabbits, I think rabbits good eating. I, you I mean, do? I've had it a couple times in restaurants, and, you know, we've we've hunted and brought home rabbit every now and then. Like, your family? Well, yeah, I mean, I lived out in the desert, so. Wait, 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 wait. So you went out into the quote-unquote wilderness, shot a rabbit, and then, like, skinned it, cooked it, and ate it in the wilderness? Well, no. Okay, or went not, home or whatever. But. Yeah, I'm all... Well, okay, so I was young. My dad actually got the shot off, and he, he's the one who actually killed the rabbit. But, yeah, mm-hmm. we skinned it, and we brought it home, and then we you know, made sure we soaked it in a brine overnight to make sure there were no weird diseases in it, and then we, then we ate it, yeah. Your childhood and my childhood are so different. <laughs> you mean you don't hunt jackrabbit in Orange County? No. Oh. Again, I've said this before, but if I lived in, you know, Randland, I would die in days. Like, there's, there's, I don't know how to skin something. I don't know how to hunt my own food. Like, no. What? No. <laughs> Elias confirms that parents' plan, while good in theory, was really stupid. Since yeah. they don't know where they're going. We get this a little bit in the book. It says, Camelin, Elias wheezed while he, when he could talk again, the path that you're following, the line that you've taken the last two days, you'll pass a hundred miles or more north of Camelin. <laughs> Maps, people. Maps. <laughs> <laughs> he also confirms that there would be no villages or farms along the way to stop and ask directions. And... They could go all the way to the spine of the world without ever running into a single person. Yeah. And part of this, like, like as Americans, it's really hard to imagine that much open land, at least coming from California. Definitely. But I suppose that the people in Randland just haven't destroyed all their natural resources like we have. So yeah, there's seriously. that. Yeah. I mean, especially coming from Southern California, where we take every possible like foot of available space and build something on it. Usually Starbucks. Usually the idea of, um, there being enough open land that you can go for days or weeks or even longer at a time without running into another person or any sign of habitation. It doesn't compute for me. Like it's, it's not possible. Like I, I don't know how that even happens. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's what freeways are for. Yeah. So it's been a while since Elias has been around people. Oh, yeah. And his social skills are lacking. <laughs> that's, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, he's rolling on the floor laughing at weird stuff. I mean, they wonder if he's completely mad because they don't know what to make of him. He's just weird. <laughs> yeah. And then we get this super tense moment when the wolves just kind of walk in and lay down next to the humans like it's nothing. Yeah. These are wild wolves. Yeah. 
Now, I'm not as big a fan of dogs as I am of cats, but I really love and respect the power and the beauty of wolves. Mm-hmm. Perrin and Egwin, and especially Bella, freak out. But it's because they're basically going to be dinner if this does not go well. I feel really bad for Bella in this scene. Yeah, I mean, I she's do. a horse. She's like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. she. Yeah. I mean, she's the creator, so she's fine. <laughs> but still... <laughs> So Perrin knows that there's even more wolves in the darkness besides the ones by the fire, uh-huh. the, the four by the fire. Uh, the wolves are not tame and not pets. Yeah, they're they're wild. Yeah. So they're dangerous. And even though they seem to be at ease, they can flip on a dime and kill all the humans in a snap. Yeah, absolutely. So it's just a little tense. It is. I like the way Jordan describes their communications. Yeah. Like, I like the way that the wolves don't talk in words. Um, They communicate with feelings and impressions and pictures. And it makes more sense because, of course, animals don't think like humans do. Like, why would they use words to communicate with each other? They don't have language the way we do. Right. Um, It's just, it's a nice touch so that the communicating with the wolves doesn't seem cheesy or forced or contrived. Like it, it actually makes sense and it's really cool. Yeah. I, I, I love how old it fe- they feel. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. The knowledge of the wolves is passed down as a history of experience through time. Mm-hmm. And Elias explains how the wolves describe how long it's been since they've hunted with men. Yeah. And they carry this sense of something so deep that, Words can't fully express it. Exactly. Yeah, it's really great. So poor Elias, he had to figure out this wolf brother thing all by himself. Yeah. Like, he must have thought he was going mad. Perrin's so lucky to have stumbled upon someone who could explain what what was happening to him. Yeah, he's really You know, like, can you imagine, like, this stuff just sort of popping into your head? And there's no context, and there's no one to ask about it. Right. It's not written down in books. You know, the Ace and I don't really know what's going on. Some of them think that it's of the Dark One. Right. I mean, that's horrifying, you know? Yeah, I feel really bad for him. Yeah. So, I mean, as much as Perrin resists and resents all this, he's really lucky to have come across Elias. Yeah, he really Also, is. Elias is cool, which is helpful. <laughs> it does help. <laughs> he especially comes in handy later. But, yeah. Um, oh, also, I really love when Egwin asks Elias if he can teach them to talk to wolves. <laughs> it's adorable. <laughs> yeah. She always wants to learn. You know, even when she's totally creeped out. (laughs) And I admire her thirst for knowledge. I really do, even when it leads her to do really stupid stuff later. Yes, it will. I also think it's really funny when they're uh, talking about the story that they worked out. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Perrin basically implies that Egwin is a better liar than he is. Because the fact is, she is a better liar. She lies (laughs) all the time. Oh, ironic, since she'll be there on the seat. Yeah. They actually worked out a really good crafted story here. They did. And if it wasn't for the wolves reading Perrin's mind, they probably would have gotten away with it. Yeah, considering their limited knowledge of the world, they did a good job trying to make up for that. Yeah, Elias keeps a conversational tone here, while, but he's totally threatening them. It's so matter of fact. Yep, the wolves want to kill you. (laughs) Ho hum. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing what we know about how things work out, it's easy to forget the absurdity of Elias's response to their story. He's all like, well, the story sounds, you know, possible, but these wolves just telepathically told me that you were thinking about getting away with lying to me, so I think I'll let them eat you now. It's a pity. I really hate having to kill people I just fed. <laughs> what? <laughs> I did like that line. It's like, I hate having to kill people I just fed. It's like, oh. Well, okay. At least you have your standards. <laughs> so, and, and you know, looking back on this, having read it a couple times, it's it's kind of funny. But at the time, the first time I read this through, it was really suspenseful. Like, oh, who yeah. the heck no, is this totally. crazy guy? It is. It's absolutely suspenseful. It, it does work. But, you know, after you've read it a few times, it is pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Elias also tells us how he doesn't get on with Ace and I. Especially the Red Oz, who yeah. wanted to gentle him. Mm. And <laughs> his description of events, oh my gosh. So he says, 
I told them to their faces they were black Aja. Serve the dark one, I said. And they didn't like that at all. <laughs> Damn, Elias, you got balls. Like, you told Ace and I they were black Aja, which basically is dark friends. People who serve, serve the, the dark, dark one. one. Like, it is something the Ace and I deny exists. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they wouldn't like that. <laughs> and then also what he says, wouldn't have worked on me gently. But it made me mad, them wanting to try. <laughs> <laughs> How dare I they? love it. I love that. <laughs> Oy. So I like Elias a lot. <laughs> let's just take a moment to process this, okay? So Elias told Ace and I that they were Black Oz, killed a quote quote, a couple of their warders, and then lived to tell the tale. Step aside, Tom Maryland, there's another badass in town. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Although, okay, so we should probably explain who Elias is. Um, and I got this mostly from the Wat Wiki. Elias was born in Tyr, mm-hmm. went off to the Borderlands, and became a soldier in Shinar. And then at some point, he met Lan and helped train him. Um, he was bonded as a warder by a green sister uh, named Rena Havden, who let him go when the wolf brother thing happened because she didn't want the reds to gentle him. So she masked the bond. Um, and he regrets having to kill the other warders to escape the Ace Sedai. Like mm. he still has mixed feelings about Chandler's though. He really does not like the reds. Can't imagine why. Um, and he's basically chosen to shun humans and lives mostly with the wolves. But I mean, so he comes across the whole badass thing. Honestly, I mean, he was a warder. he, Trained in the Borderlands. Like, he's he's got skills. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. It's That's not right. just the wolf thing. So, one thing that caught me this time through, uh, as the wolves have settled in uh, around the campfire, did, did you catch this line that says, one of the wolves, Hopper, he thought, this is Perrin thinking, uh-huh. um, looked at him and seemed to grin. He wondered how he had put a name to him. Uh-huh. So, what this means, at least the way I read this, is that Hopper is the first wolf to intentionally communicate with Perrin. Oh. Which is kind of cool, given how important Hopper is going to be to Perrin in the coming books. Oh, yeah, that is cool. Yeah. I I remember the line, but I didn't uh, put two and two together. Mm. Cool. Yeah, I, I just saw it this time, so. Yeah, okay. Um, so Elias tells us that uh, Trollocs are afraid of the wolf packs. Ah. And it's because once a wolf gets the scent of shadow spawn, they don't give up until they bring them down, even right. if it costs most of the pack. Right. Um, because, I mean, the wolves basically see hunting down shadow spawn as their responsibility. Like, that's their duty. Um, that's their their role, really. Right. Um, so once they get the scent of a Trolloc or a Miradrol, like, they are not letting that thing go. Which is cool. Very cool. <laughs> um. All right, so we can't end this chapter without talking about Perrin's relationship to the wolves. Okay. Perrin refuses to admit that he can talk to the wolves for a long time. Very long time. And I understand his initial resistance. Like, this is a weird thing, and Elias is freaking crazy. Yes, he is. So it makes (laughs) sense that in, in this book that... Uh, Perrin's not okay. <laughs> he, he's not okay with this. And, and, and that, that's fine. But Perrin's resistance to the wolves lasts way too long. It's yeah. like the coolest power ever. And then emo Perrin has no appreciation for it, even though it's super useful to him over and over again throughout the series. You know, like, I, I am totally fine with him wigging out about the wolves for the first couple books. But in The Great Hunt... After yeah. Rand and Loyal and Hurin get zapped to the other dimension, um, like, and Perrin has to contact the wolves and kind of take over being a sniffer to track the horn. Right. Um, that's when he really starts to, to use this power for the first time. And that should have gotten him a lot closer to accepting it. And then, if not then, then especially after Dumai's Wells. Right. Where he called the wolves and they came to their deaths, basically, to save him. Like, after that, he should not have had any resistance to the wolves. 
And it just, it's it's really frustrating because this is super cool. The wolves never let him down. Mm. And all he does is use them. And the wolves call him out for it later, too. Deservedly so. Because, yeah. yeah, he's like, he uses them when he needs them and then completely shuns them and is resentful of them all the other times. It's like, screw you, Perrin. Like, what did you ever do for us? You know? I just, I don't know. Yeah. I, like I said, I understand the the reticence and the resistance and just him being uncomfortable with it. Right. At first, totally makes sense, but it just went on way too long. Like, Mr. Broody Pants needed to get over himself. <laughs> Mr. Broody Pants. I'm just Pants. saying. Yeah. So, that ends chapters 22 and 23 of The Eye of the World. Yay! Join us next week when we discuss chapters 24 and 25, where a lot happens, so you'll have to listen in on that episode. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Wheel of Time pod through. We'll see you again next week. Make sure that you rate and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Maybe leave us a positive review. It really helps us out. It does. We uh, end up showing up on the recommended podcasts and we're more easily searchable when you rate us or review us. So we're not just saying that. It does actually help us. Drive the uh, algorithm. <laughs> you can tweet at us at wadpodthru or email us at wadpodthru at gmail.com and tell us your thoughts on anything we covered today. Do you agree with us that Perrin's a broody pants? Do you think the wolf power is super cool? Or do you think that Perrin has the right of it, that uh, this is just too creepy for words? Let <laughs> us know your thoughts. That's W-O-T-P-O-D-T-H-R-U at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody, and we hope that the wheel weaves you in our direction again soon.